All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the March talk from the Yorkshire Local Center of the Royal Meteorological Society. My name is Ben Pickering. I'm a research fellow with the National Center for Atmospheric Science, and I'll be your host for this evening's event. We also have Tom Sharp co-chairing. Tom, do you want to just turn your camera on and say hello to everyone? Tom is an undergraduate student studying meteorology at the University of Leeds, and Tom's here to take over the chairing in case of any issues on my end. I will also be highlighting any of your questions in the chat. So first of all, some logistics. The talk will last approximately 30 minutes, and then it'll be followed by 15 minutes or so for any of your questions or comments. You can put your comments and questions in the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we have the ability to display these in the main window during the Q&A session at the end of the talk. So now on to the main event. Tonight we have a wonderful talk brought to us by Richard Martin Barton. Richard, if you want to just turn on your camera and say hello to everyone. Hi everybody. Excellent. Uh, I'll now bring up your slides. All right, so Richard is an operational meteorologist who's been obsessed by the weather for as long as he can remember. The extreme summer rainfall of July 2007 and the severe cold and long-lasting snow of December 2010 made deep impressions on him when he was growing up. A degree in meteorology at the University of Reading ensued, with, with Richard graduating in 2016. He now puts his skills to use professionally as a meteorologist for MetDesk, but continues his passion for weather outside of work uh, with a keen interest in thunderstorms, snow and noctilucent clouds. He's been lucky enough to chase severe thunderstorms on the Great Plains of the USA and maintains an extensive meteorological website called Stratusdeck. Over to you, Richard. And uh, yeah, welcome to this talk on the uh, winter weather, which we saw just a few weeks ago, actually, in uh, early to mid February of last month. And we're just going to get started here, actually, just even on the title slide here. Um, we've got a number of interesting features here. We're actually looking at a visible satellite image um, of the UK and surrounding areas uh, on the 8th of February. So this is during the peak of the, the cold, really, um, for the UK, with a strong easterly flow um, across uh, across the UK. And you can see these uh, quite frequent uh, little speckled uh, showers across uh, the North Sea, uh, stretching north from North Yorkshire up towards uh, Aberdeenshire um, and eastern parts of Scotland as well. Um, with a lot of high cloud, actually medium and high cloud around across uh, southern and southeastern parts of, um, of the UK and also across adjacent areas of the near continent. And that was a uh, leftover cloud from uh, the previous day when we had a, a, a significant winter storm actually across uh, the Netherlands and southeast uh, England called Storm Darcy, which we'll get onto in just a second. But enough of the, uh, the, the title slide here. Let's get into the nitty gritty of things. We'll just want to take a step back at first, actually, and just have a look at the preconditioning elements um, which led towards this severe cold outbreak. And we need to take a look at the polar vortex for this now. Um, for those of you perhaps not so uh, in, the know, in the know about this, the polar vortex is a cyclonic circulation which develops in the polar stratosphere around the North Pole um, every, every winter season, peaking in intensity with westerly winds in the stratosphere in sort of January um, and then gradually fading, at least climatologically speaking, as we go through um, the sort of the, the springtime period. Now, roughly every three in uh, roughly in every three and every five winters, we do actually end up seeing uh, a significant weakening of the uh, the vortex in the middle of the winter, and uh, we call these uh, these weakening sudden stratospheric uh, warmings. Now, of course, we've seen these quite famously. We saw one in 2018 that led to the significant cold easterly outbreak. Um, we saw uh, in late uh, February and early March 2018, uh, the, the beast from the east, so to speak, uh, coined by the media there. Um, and a similar event actually occurred in um, January, early January of this year, perhaps not quite to the same uh, extent, however. So we did see a couple of significant weakenings of the polar vortex. One initially on the 5th of January, uh, where the vortex was actually displaced away from the pole. Um, and then we saw another weakening around the 15th of January. Um, and that was actually more of a split. So the vortex actually tried to split into two separate uh, daughter vortices um, over, or uh, well, in this case, over Russia and, and the sort of North Atlantic. Now, the, the vortex really did take a battering as we go through uh, January. We'll just take a look at the next slide here, um, which we're actually looking at here, uh, effectively, the zonal mean, zonal winds, which is a measure of the, the westerly winds, essentially, in the stratosphere at 60 degrees north. And you can see the red line here. That's the, uh, the strength of the stratosphere essentially um, through this year and um, we actually saw this uh, this SSW occurring around about the fifth and you see, can see a second 
uh, weakening uh, event, which is when the, the, the zonal winds drop below zero meters per second. So that's when your typical westerly winds turn easterly. Again, we saw another of those weakening events around about the 15th and then a final third one around about the 29th and the 30th of uh, January. So these three events, they look, uh, perhaps they might be classified as separate events, but really uh, in, the, in the scientific literature, you'll find that actually when you see separate warming events like this generally occurring within 30 days of one another, they can all be classified as the same uh, southern stratospheric warming events. We've seen since then the polar vortex um, intensify um, as we go through uh, February and into March. But the fact is, a weak polar vortex, that tends to coincide with um, a more southerly displaced uh, jet stream and that ultimately opens the door to colder winds either from a north northeast or an easterly direction um, across Europe. If we contrast this just very quickly to the blue line here that shows the strength essentially of the zonal winds in the stratosphere last winter we remember that February of last year February 2020 was extremely stormy across the UK in fact it was the wettest February on record uh, and one of the stormiest months as well it, I think it was the stormiest month in 30 years for large waves of, of England and Wales. And that ultimately coincided with a very strong polar vortex as well. So two contrasting years, two contrasting Februarys as well. We'll just take a look here um, very quickly at uh, the first uh, video I've got to show you here. So we've got to hear um, the uh, essentially once it loads in, here we go, the uh, synoptic pattern. So I'll just pause it here as we go through um, the first part of the month. We're just going to restart the video actually very quickly as well, um, just to get things going from the beginning of the month. And uh, this shows you that basically the metal surface pressure analyses through the first few days of the month. So we're around about the, the, the first, second and third here of the month. And actually, I'll pause it here on the on the fourth. And we had very cyclonic conditions across England and Wales to start February. Um, but with high pressure, you can see actually centered across the Norwegian Sea uh, out towards Greenland as well. And uh, that was ultimately the beginning at this stage anyway to uh, shift a bit more southwestwards. Um, but what you, what you do notice if we, is if we play this video on was just a little bit, um, you'll notice a deep cyclonic circulation trying to develop here on the fifth across uh, England and Wales. And you've got this active warm front at this stage uh, sat across uh, eastern Scotland. Now that gave some massive snowfall totals um, across uh, high, up, upper ground in the, or high ground, I should say, in eastern Scotland, particularly around the Cairngorm Plateau. Um, there were massive snowfall accumulations, um, I think over a metre in places just from this one particular event on the 5th and into the 6th of February uh, from this active front, um, particularly above a thousand metres uh, elevation. But ultimately, I remember seeing some uh, uh, NWP sort of um, uh, snow, um, snow sort of uh, graphics, and they were looking at in terms of total accumulations of snow on the high ground, four to five meters of snow. Uh, that's accumulation of snow from previous events throughout the the, pre the the earlier in the winter as well. But significant snowfall in those parts. But actually, if we just play on uh, the uh, the graphic here, you'll notice while Scotland stays in a cold easterly flow, you actually start to see that easterly airflow advance more rapidly uh, across England and Wales, particularly through the sixth and the seventh of of February. So that weekend. Um, really ushered in the really cold easterly airflow from, um, well, we'll talk about Scandinavia, but also eastern parts of Europe as well. If I just pause the front here, um, the, the graphic here, you've also got an area of low pressure there, uh, hinted at 996 centered over, uh, I guess, that sort of western Germany and also into the low countries. Uh, one of my favorite features there, I guess, is uh, this sort of upper level warm front as well um, across uh, southeast England and into East Anglia. Now, that ultimately gave some very heavy snowfall um, across the southeast corner of the front uh, associated with Storm Darcy, particularly through the 7th um, of the month. But if we continue to play on the animation, um, essentially, uh, you've got that easterly flow continuing. Ultimately, you ended up with these uh, significant uh, convergence line bands. Uh, so here you can see three separate bands, one going um, westwards from the Skagarik Strait, that's in between Denmark and uh, southern Norway there, right in towards the central belt of Scotland. And you can see a couple of other uh, sort of convergence lines, one across the, the Humber estuary there and one across North Norfolk as well. And uh, these uh, we sometimes give these names, I guess, from a colloquial point of view and an operational uh, sense as well, uh, that northernmost stream for example, or snow streamers, we tend to call them, uh, sometimes known as the Skagarik streamer. Sometimes you can see uh, a snow shower band that moves into the Thames estuary. Uh, some, some, some people like to refer to that as the, uh, the Thames tickler as well, very, very colloquially. But we didn't see that so much in uh, this particular easterly event. Uh, as we continue to play the animation forward, though, that easterly flow continued, but eventually we saw the winds actually turn more southeasterly as we go towards the sort of 11th and 12th 
of the month and ultimately this is when the significant snow showers to the east coast of, of England and Wales um, started to, or England and Scotland I should say, started to uh, to fade away. We had a more continental influence by this stage, uh, a drier air mass in place. Still very cold though, still a very cold continental influence but uh, by no means uh, significant, uh, significantly snowy let's say. Really the, uh, the ushering in of any milder Atlantic flows really didn't begin until we got to the 14th of February in particular by this stage you're seeing much more cyclonic conditions out in the North Atlantic with a more powerful Atlantic jet stream uh, starting to uh, to power in. Notice, however, even by the 14th, there's still a decent area of high pressure uh, located across uh, Germany up towards southern Scandinavia as well. So that really prevented uh, the milder intrusions of air from making their way too far eastwards, uh, at least at least before the 15th of the of the month. I'll just go back to the uh, the actual slides here, though. And uh, we'll continue on. Uh, if we just go on to the next uh, uh, sort of graphic here, we're just looking at the strength of the jet stream here. So I mentioned when we're talking about the polar vortex, how the uh, the jet stream actually tends to be weaker when, or further south, I should say, when you see this, these weaker polar vortices, uh, vortexes. And this was the case definitely around the start of our really cold easterly airflow. So yes, at the surface, um, if you trace the solid black lines, those are the surface pressure, uh, mean sea level pressure lines, I guess. Um, if you follow those lines, you need, then yes, we do have an easterly flow at the surface, but actually the jet stream denoted by the shading here. So we're looking at the 300 hectopascal winds. So those are the winds at about seven to eight kilometers altitude uh, in the troposphere. The jet stream is located really far south across Iberia, uh, southern France, and out towards the Mediterranean as well. Um, so really not, not, not in any position at this stage to usher in any milder flows, um, at least uh, from the Atlantic. But if we go towards the sort of end of our colder spell of weather, so we take the 13th as an example here. Uh, this is when, if you remember back to the surface uh, analyses before, um, you had a, a more of an Atlantic base flow trying to move in from the southwest. Well, ultimately, here you go. Here's your stronger jet stream trying to push in uh, from the Atlantic towards the UK. Of course, it's not going to make too much of, of an inroad across Europe, this decent area of high pressure. Um, Greenland up to up to Norway really being enhanced by actually this uh, rather strange looking perhaps uh, northwesterly jet um, across uh, the central parts of, of Europe. But yeah, the, the tendency for the jet stream to be ushered further south by that weakened polar vortex uh, was definitely one of the driving factors perhaps behind our colder easterly period, which you saw uh, only lasting really six days or so, um, five to six days across uh, the northwest corner of Europe, at least anyway. So let's have a look at some of the actual the sensible impacts that we saw at the surface. Uh, this this one I just took um, is uh, sort of in, um, in in Folkestone actually. So you're looking at some of the the hills just above Folkestone. We're only talking really about 100 110 meters uh, altitude. Uh, this was taken a couple of days after we saw significant snowfall in the southeast from uh, Storm Darcy. Now Folkestone saw around about 10 to 12 uh, centimeters of snow, um, but on the high on the high ground there was significant drifting. We had strong northeasterly winds and we got to remember that the snow which fell for a lot of places was not the dry the was not the wet uh, sticky snow which we're quite accustomed to seeing in this country but it was much more of a dry powdery type snow uh, or more of a continental let's say uh, type snow and that makes it very easy to, to blow around essentially particularly in strong easterly winds so you don't need very much uh, level snow to give significant drifts and this was definitely the case um, on these exposed roads even down right towards the south coast uh, here's your classic picture of a, a four by four well it's not very much use in this case i guess still being stuck uh, by the massive uh, the massive or not the fairly large drifts but a nice uh, picture which just shows how how uh, far south the uh, the snow really did settle and even on beaches on the south coast of england south coast of essex and suffolk as well there was a, there was accumulating snowfall just a quick uh, look here, actually, as well at um, some of the uh, snow accumulations. So we're using a bit of citizen science uh, as well here with uh, some radar based uh, estimates of snowfall. So um, we, what, we, what uh, I should say, this is a, met, uh, this is a uh, weather quest graphic here. But what um, what we've got here essentially is the members of the public have um, has submitted their own snow reports essentially to give a much uh, higher resolution of data than what the um, individual uh, Met Office stations can provide on their own. And you're just looking at in, this, in the southeast corner, you're looking at areas across um, Essex and Suffolk in particular, which saw the highest snowfall totals associated with Storm Darcy. And you saw about 20 to 25 centimeters in there. And even down towards, uh, let's say, South End and the Isle of Sheppey and up towards uh, the, north, the north bounds around the Maidstone sort of area, there was significant snowfall even down there. So fairly unusual areas to see very heavy snowfall again around 20 centimeters or so and i do believe 
um, far eastern parts of, of Kent in particular saw some of the highest snowfall totals. I think Manston in Kent, uh, the airfield there, saw um, far eastern Kent saw a snow, snow depth of 15 centimetres from this particular event. And that was the greatest snow depth there since the significantly cold outbreak of January 1987, I do believe. But even across uh, the likes of Norfolk, and into um, southern parts of Lincolnshire as well. You can see a significant snowfall uh, totals there. Now, they weren't so much as a result of uh, our active front from Storm Darcy, but they were really uh, more a feature from frequent snow showers actually pushing westwards from the North Sea. So the likes of uh, central northern Norfolk, for example, there's a bullseye there around about uh, 30 centimetres, around about a foot of snow. And actually, well, what did that look like? Well, here you go. Here's some ideas, for, here's some sort of aerial photography uh, from Norfolk regarding that snowfall. That's all well and nice, but you can't actually tell how much snow is on the ground. Well, here you go. There's your, your foot of snow in uh, central uh, Norfolk. Now, this is a pretty impressive image um, from the UK, if I'm honest. Uh, now, there was more snow, I should say, um, across Scotland. We'll get on to that in just a minute. But um, this is a, an image which you might expect to see more about um, across uh, for, perhaps in the in the USA, for example. Uh, let's say in Buffalo, New, New York State, for example, some lake effect snow might give similar sort of totals to this. Um, but a significant snowfall, Norfolk, one of climatologically one of the driest parts of the UK, but does very well in these easterly airflows. Um, particularly when you get frequent snow showers uh, moving westwards. Of course, if you're in central and western parts of the country, uh, you may not have seen so much snow. I'm in the um, just north of, northwest of London here, in Chiltern Hills, really, and there was very little snow. We only really had about one to two centimetres. It was a very dry, powdery type snow, and it did blur around quite a lot, but there really wasn't all that much. And generally, you know, if you've got an easterly airflow like this, a very cold easterly airflow like that, you're not guaranteed snow everywhere, particularly across central and western uh, parts of the country. Eastern areas, maybe you might see some, some decent snow, but it's never a guarantee in these setups. Uh, the, 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 the snow showers, they tend to fade as they move westwards away from the heat and moisture source of the North Sea and also being blocked by terrain such as the Pennines and other uh, topographic features. But still, some very impressive uh, snow there in, uh, in Norfolk. I should say, I think Braemar, um, there was a snow, an unofficial snow depth, I should say, recorded in Braemar of 70 centimetres, um, which was, uh, I, think, uh, I think it was a record for that particular site anyway. Um, but it wasn't unofficial uh, snow depth, but that was uh, particularly impressive um, in the uh, eastern end of the Cairngorms in, uh, in Scotland there. We're just going to go on to a, uh, another little video here as well. Um, just looking at, uh, the, just from a, uh, an NWP, a numerical weather prediction point of view, I'll just restart the video here as well. Um, just looking at where, uh, where we're at in terms of maximum and minimum, minimum temperatures. Now I'm a forecaster and we're using model data all the time to try and work out um, how, uh, how, well, not just how cold and how hot it will be, but also the other sensible weather impacts. But here's an example. I've just taken the GFS here as an example, just looking at some of the maximum and minimum temperatures it was predicting um, across the UK. And I just want to pause it very quickly. You can see, it's not, obviously, it was very cold multiple days in a row. But if you pause it on the 10th and the 11th of February, for example, and we'll talk a bit about a bit more about this in the next couple of slides. But we know that across um, the highlands of Scotland, uh, temperatures fell well down into the minus double digits, uh, negative uh, teen Celsius in a number of places, of course. And on the 11th of February, we saw temperatures even lower than that. How well is, G is GFS in this case doing? Mm, not that well. It's sort of got temperatures minus 10, minimum temperatures minus 10 to uh, minus 12 degrees in there. We just play it through to minus to uh, the next day. Here we go. Uh, this particular day, we saw temperatures minus, below minus 20 degrees in a number of places uh, in the morning of the 11th across Scotland. How well is the model doing? Mm, not that well. Again, it's only a um, a global model here with relatively coarse resolution, and we do have uh, finer scale models to home in uh, on, on minimum temperatures like this. But just perhaps uh, an inkling that these um, these really cold outbreaks, particularly when we've got significant lying snow on the ground, they really expose the issues uh, that numerical weather prediction can have, particularly with trying to forecast or accurately predict uh, minimum temperatures. So just some food for thought there, perhaps, um, from a forecaster's point of view, at least anyway. Uh, the models are never perfect, but actually, uh, in these uh, really cold outbreaks, particularly when you've got significant lying snow on the ground, it really does expose the issues that the models already have uh, regarding uh, temperature forecasts in particular. We'll just go back again now to uh, the uh, talk, uh, to the, some of the other slides that I've got going here. What about the rest of Europe? Well, we know it was cold across uh, the UK, and we'll, we'll continue to talk about that in a minute. But I just want to qu quickly go over 
uh, the rest of Europe as well. Uh, these are some of the minimum temperatures from the GFS model again, um, around about the 10th of, of February. On this particular morning, um, we saw a temperature, I've just got it written down here, of minus 26.7 in central Germany in a place called uh, Mulhausen. Uh, how, how cold is that compared to, uh, compared to some of the extreme records set in Germany? Well, it's a good 12 degrees off the overall all-time minimum temperature set in Germany, which was about minus 39. I did, I did check the stats for that. So yes, it's extremely cold, but it's nowhere near the all-time record uh, temperature-wise uh, in Germany. Of course, uh, if you were to go go forward just another uh, day here as well, just look at the min minimum temperatures on the on the 11th, even colder in this particular day uh, across southern Norway, uh, for example. You saw temperatures below minus 30 degrees across the, the higher mountains of, of southern Norway. Again, how unusual is that? Well, not too, not too, not too significant really. Compared, I mean, it's it is cold, obviously, uh, and it's fairly, fairly significant compared to climatology. But it by no means is that a uh, significant record. Um, I believe the minimum temperature uh, recorded in the Netherlands, uh, which was hit pre pretty badly by um, this uh, this snowstorm, Storm Darcy, on the eighth of the month. I believe the minimum temperature there was about minus uh, minus eleven degrees. Looking on the um, according to KNMI, the Dutch Royal, Royal Meteorological Service, uh, that sort of temperature you can expect to see once in every four years. In, uh, in the Netherlands, so it just gives you an idea of, as to the extremity of the uh, of the conditions. Of course, in the in the Netherlands, there were famous images of people uh, ice skating on the on the canals, on the frozen canals uh, there, uh, and they did have, have some significant impacts uh, from uh, this storm, this winter storm. I think the the, the, the weather service there issued a, a code red uh, weather warning on the eighth of the month for uh, widespread drifting of snow um, and blizzard conditions. Uh, so there was significant uh, disruption. We had about they had about roughly about five to 15 centimeters across most of the country, locally 25 centimeters um, in, in, the, in the east there. But that's, um, that's enough of, of the rest of Europe. What about um, the UK more particularly? Well, quite, quite famously, perhaps, um, we saw some pretty impressive minimum temperatures, particularly on the morning of the 11th of February. So Bremer, I've got it pointed out there, roughly speaking, minus 23 degrees on the 11th of the month. Now, that was uh, a, a pretty a, a astonishingly low temperature. It was actually the lowest temperature recorded in the UK since the 30th of December 1995. And, uh, and it was the coldest temp or the lowest temperature recorded in February since 1955. So some extremely cold, uh, cold temperatures there eclipsing. Um, the beast from the east in 2018. That wasn't. We never really saw any particularly low temperatures um, during that sort of event. And even the famously cold uh, winter, and particularly the December of 2010. Of course, that was the second coldest December on record uh, for the UK. And we saw eight separate occasions during that winter with temperatures um, below minus 20. But we never got below minus 21.3 in 2010. So minus 23 uh, is better than that. But of course, it was only one night. Uh, that we saw those temperatures. Uh, just for info, we did see, I think it was minus 21.3 at Kinbrace in uh, in Sutherland and also minus 20.9 at um, Aboyne in, in Aberdeenshire as well. So three separate official observation stations uh, dropping below minus 20 degrees on uh, on that particular morning. Now, some of the reasons why we saw temperatures so low and colder than perhaps even colder air masses that we saw in 2018 and, and 2010. Well, we saw pretty much perfect conditions for a, a, a so-called radiation uh, night of clear skies, uh, light winds, a cold, a deeply cold air mass already in place and deep long lasting snow cover in place as well. Now, of course, snow is a very good radiator of uh, long wave radiation into the atmosphere and it also insulates the surface. Um, from or well, it, it insulates the ground from warming the air too much. So essentially, you've ended up with perfect conditions in in the sheltered glens. We can end up with cold pooling and drainage flows for temperatures to fall extremely low. Now, I think it's hard to imagine um, perhaps, perhaps how uh, how we can possibly get to minus twenty three degrees in the UK. Well, I've got a couple of the next slides just showing you uh, what things looked like in Braemar on the morning of the eleventh. And uh, this is uh, one particular uh, photograph of around Braemar Town Centre on that particular morning of the 11th. Well, these are conditions you'd probably expect to see in uh, Scandinavia or, uh, or, Lap or Finnish Lapland, perhaps. Uh, not so much in Scotland, but still extremely impressive. You can see the sun just rising on the opposite side of the, uh, of the valley there. But deep snowfall, I said earlier, 70 centimetres was recorded in Braemar. And uh, here you go. There's an example of uh, another example of the extreme, extreme conditions there on that particular morning. So when you've got such deep snow cover under clear skies of light winds, yes, temperatures will really plummet um, overnight, particularly in a very cold air mass that we did have um, around about the 10th and the 11th of, uh, of February. 
What does the uh, actual temperature trace look like? Well, here you go. Um, we actually saw a period of about six to uh, seven days with temperatures actually staying at or below or below below freezing, I should say, really. Um, and this is uh, the trace from Braemar itself. And we saw a couple of uh, several nights in a row, three nights in a row of temperatures falling below minus 10. Um, but the, the, obviously, this is the, the period through the 10th and the 11th um, when we saw the lowest temperatures. Um, essentially, what you're having, if you um, just look at the temperature trace um, at the top um, of where things start to fall away. You're looking, you're looking at around about 3 p.m. on the 10th of uh, February. Uh, the sun starts to set below the, the valley tops. And then essentially, once you start, once you lose that solar radiation, once you're in the shadow, temperatures plummeted under the clear skies. And by the time you got to six o'clock in the evening, it was already minus 13 uh, in Braemar. And ultimately, yes, we did get down to minus 23. But look at the, but look at the, uh, the graphic there. It's quite, uh, it's quite spiky. And uh, it really just highlights uh, these, perhaps the shallowness of the cold air during these events. So yes, it's minus 23 degrees, but the, the, the depth of the cold is really very shallow. And if you were to rise only a few tens of meters above the surface, uh, you'd probably be looking at temperatures five or 10 degrees warmer than that, um, just within the lowest few tens of meters. And these sort of spiky nature of the graph is uh, just a testament to very small perturbations in either the wind direction or perhaps slight perturbations in the drainage of the, of the cold air that lead to, to some mixing of the air and ultimately some more significant temperature variations uh, there as well. We're just going to take a quick look now at uh, some uh, comparisons uh, here between Heathrow um, for uh, the cold air we saw in fe last February, uh, this February I should say, and also in 2018 as well, just to give an idea of, of where things were at compared to uh, perhaps the more well-known beast from the east in, in 2018. Now um, Heathrow did actually see an ice day, so that's a day when temperatures um, were remained at or below zero degrees in both events. Um, we can we can have a look at this uh, particular period. We saw a fairly lengthy period from the 8th through to the 13th of, of the month with temperatures really struggling to rise above uh, zero uh, for Heathrow. As I said, it was only one day which, saw it, which was, was a nice day um, in Heathrow. Um, but actually, if you compare that to 2018, um, the cold perhaps not quite as long lasting in 2018, but when it was at its most severe, if you follow the red line here, uh, following the the, uh, the air temperature. If you, if you follow that, then we did get down to, let's say, minus five degrees uh, or so. We should take into account that it was quite breezy um, uh, for both events there. And uh, that really prevents temperatures from dropping away uh, too far. Um, but yeah, the depth, the, the depth of the most significant cold, perhaps in Heathrow at least anyway, perhaps a little bit more intense um, during the uh, 2018 event that we saw compared to uh, 2021. Uh, we're just going to compare now as well um, up in uh, up in Scotland on Cairngorm, we're fortunate to have a, a weather station uh, on the, on one of the highest mountains in the country. This is over 1,200 meters above sea level, and uh, just sampling the effectively uh, a more significant uh, depth of the air mass, essentially uh, 1.2 kilometers above above sea level. You're not going to see so much uh, temperature variations on the summit of Cairngorm. It's going to be quite breezy. It was quite breezy uh, in this event. So again, you're looking at air temperatures around about. Uh, minus nine to minus 11 degrees persisting for um, a period of uh, four, four to maybe five days or so on uh, on Cairngorm. How does that compare to 2018? Well, if you look at, uh, at this, we had a period initially up to the 27th with uh, air temperatures around about minus eight. But then you can see a really cold air mass pushed um, westwards across uh, the sort of the Cairngorm plateau through the 28th and into the first of, of the month in 2018. And temperatures then actually dropped down to minus 14 degrees. So at the height, the height of the cold air mass during 2018, it was indeed more severe than uh, what we saw uh, last month. Uh, just a bit of extra info actually on, on Cairngorm. During that um, easterly uh, airflow, we did end up seeing uh, temperatures, uh, or I should say, um, wind chill values down to minus 28 or minus 29 degrees on, on Cairngorm then. So some significant wind chill as well with strong easterly winds coupling with the extremely uh, low temperatures there. Just a quick comparison now, uh, satellite imagery. Uh, this is again the, the title slide that we saw um, here for the 8th of February um, for the UK. You can just about make out the snow covered um, hills and mountains there across uh, Scotland and down into Northern England as well. And indeed it was, there was significant snowfall at this stage um, across East Anglia and the Southeast. But if you just compare the, the general features of this uh, satellite image to one from 2018, 
you will notice some pretty stark, well, some pretty uh, obvious similarities here. So you've got these, these frequent uh, showers pushing westwards across the North Sea. You've got um, in, embedded within there, you've got some troughs within the flow. So some wavy features perhaps uh, within the showers across central parts of the North Sea and across Ireland and west of Ireland as well. But generally speaking, a pretty similar, pretty similar dynamics going on in both events. Perhaps though the 2018 event saw a more uh, significant uh, cold air mass in place. One thing I just want to show you here very quickly, just looking at, um, we, we've taken here essentially an area average uh, vertical temperature profile of the atmosphere across the North Sea from about the 9th of, uh, of February, so during the depth of the cold spell. And uh, you can see here, yes, uh, it's sort of a, the surface temperature around about zero degrees um, with dew points uh, around about minus two, minus three. But actually, if you consider the fact that the sea surface temperature in uh, early to mid February is around about four to six degrees in the North Sea, uh, you end up with a fairly unstable environment in the lowest layers of the atmosphere um, with um, some convective clouds that are developing, which is what we were seeing in those satellite images uh, from the, the warmth and the moisture comparatively speaking of the of the sea surface so in this case you're looking at um uh, sort of the depth of the clouds around about four to four and a half kilometers something like that uh in terms of how deep the clouds were uh, and that was ultimately what was producing our our, our snow showers across uh, eastern england and uh, and scotland as well in terms of uh, comparison of the air mass we're just taking a look here at the uh, actually, the, the temperature anomalies compared to climate of the 850 hectopascal temperatures, so those are the temperatures about a mile uh, in the atmosphere, from 2018 here on the left to uh, last month on the on the right. And uh, compared to climate, and I know we're comparing slightly different parts of the year, but they're only really two weeks apart, so it shouldn't make too much of a difference. Um, compared to climatology, the 2018 event, uh, 8 to 10 degrees below average across uh, Germany, uh, Poland eastwards. Uh, generally, in these really cold easterly outbreaks, the most significantly cold air tends to reside across the continent. Uh, a bit more of a maritime influence for the UK, so we never see so, quite such cold, uh, cold air mass in place. Uh, but actually, in uh, last month, uh, temperatures were, compared to climatology at least anyway, around about six to eight degrees uh, below average. So it wasn't quite as intense, at least compared to climatology, uh, last month again, as in 2018. But indeed, uh, February was a month of two halves. And there's a few things, uh, just a, co a couple of slides I want to show as we wrap up the talk here. Um, we're just going to take a look, uh, just a very quick look, in fact. Uh, we'll just start this video from the beginning again at um, some of the temperatures which we saw later on in the month. Now, the first half of the month was well known um, of being as being very cold with that easterly airflow. But actually, the second half of February, well, it was quite a binary month. Um, it really did warm up quite quickly across Europe. So I've just paused it here. What we ended up seeing during the second half of February was um, a southwesterly airflow initially from the uh, tropical maritime source region pushing across much of Europe. But then we actually saw high pressure build in situ, centered across uh, the Alps, uh, France and Germany as well, with, with pretty much clear skies across uh, those parts of, of Europe. And at the back end of winter, when you've got increasing strength, uh, increasing solar radiation, the sun's climbing higher in the sky. Those are the sort of perfect conditions you need for extremely warm uh, temperatures to occur. Now, of course, if you remember back a couple of years ago, February 2019, we saw record breaking warmth back then. We saw to over 21 degrees uh, in the UK. And there's a similar setup across uh, mainland Europe. Now, we didn't see the perfect conditions necessarily uh, in the UK. But if we just play this, uh, if we just play this loop forward just a little bit, um, you can just see the extent of the warmth uh, moving uh, across most of mainland Europe as we go towards that sort of period through the 22nd uh, to the 25th of February. And in terms of anomalies well if you were to take the 7th to the, th to the 13th of, uh, of February early on in the month you're probably looking at temperatures which are around about three to five degrees below normal for the UK as a whole but if you were to take um, the, the sort of the final 10 days or so of the month across large swathes of France the low countries Germany and into southern Scandinavia you're probably looking at temperatures that were six to eight degrees above normal so from a climatological point of view the cold early on in the month yes it was impressive but the warmth later on in the month was even more so and uh, that's just something I want to uh, just end this uh, this uh, presentation on. Again, we'll just start this one from the, uh, the beginning here. Um, so actually, there were a number of uh, national temperature records which were set uh, across several different countries um, as we go as we went through 
uh, the latter, latter couple of weeks of the month. So actually, we saw six national temperature records uh, set across uh, large swathes of, of Europe. Um, and actually, we saw one uh, winter time all time record set in Sweden of uh, 17 uh, degrees. And I think this really puts in perhaps puts into perspective the fact that, yes, I'm giving this talk on the severe cold that we saw early in the month. Were there any national temperature records that were set? No, uh, but we're still giving this talk anyway. And actually, Perhaps, it, perhaps the general uh, population is perhaps could be hazing out perhaps these increasingly frequent uh, warm episodes that we're seeing uh, nowadays as our uh, climate is, is quite clearly changing. And yes, of course, in the future, uh, there's going to be further um, periods of cold weather across the UK, adjacent areas of Europe, and indeed across the rest of the world. We, know, we, 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 we almost know that for sure. But um, I think the signs of an increasingly uh, warming world are uh, around us all the time anyway uh that is about it uh from myself uh guys uh we shall just pause it there and go through the final few slides and leave it there i think any questions at all and thank you very much for listening just have to imagine everyone else clapping thank you very much richard that was a very interesting talk uh i feel like now is an appropriate time to just point out that if you did enjoy this talk and this type of analysis that Richard has done, that uh, Richard actually does this quite frequently on his uh, meteorology blog, which the address is at the bottom of the screen there, stratostech.co.uk. All right, we'll move on to questions now, if you want to come back on screen, Richard. Uh, we've got the first question here from Dave. Uh, Dave's asking, having warmer North Sea temperatures, will this increase instability and generate more intense snow showers when we get cold easterly winds? The term thunder snow. Is I love thunder snow. It's great. Um, yeah, no, I think you're, you're right. Um, and to be fair, um, we did actually see some thunder snow during its easterly flow, I should say, in February. Um, but yeah, gem the general idea is, yes, you would expect to see uh, enhanced instability uh, if you've got um, warmer sea surface temperatures. However, then the, the question then turns to whether or not you can maintain the cold air mass or air masses in place, uh, for example. So if, if, the, if the tendency is perhaps, I'm just speculating here, but if the tendency is perhaps for the air masses not to be quite as warm, uh, then will that potentially outstrip the uh, the warmth which uh, which we're seeing from the increasing sea temperatures? I don't know if I'm honest with you, but the general idea is yes, you would almost certainly see uh, more instability, stronger or more intense showers if you were to see that stronger contrast uh, between the uh, the sea surface and, and the air itself. But the, uh, the basic answer to, to your question in the future is um, I, I'm not too sure if the uh, outstripping of the uh, the, uh, the air masses uh, the air masses themselves warming up would uh, would negate that. Right, we've got quite a few questions. Uh, keep them coming in the chat if you uh, have something to say. Uh, next up, we've got Dominic, who asks why such heavy snowfall in East Anglia. What are the climatological factors for this? Very well, just did very lucky, or did very lucky. Was very was very fortunate or unfortunate, perhaps, to um to see that to see some extremely heavy snowfall. Now, of course, I didn't I didn't show you uh, the extent of the snowfall across the rest of the country, but um actually some parts of eastern Scotland saw even more snowfall, forty to forty five centimeters across some eastern parts of uh, Scotland, north of uh, the central belt from the snow showers. I think, if I'm honest with you, a lot of this is just hit and miss. Uh, it's just the hit and miss nature of the showers. Some areas um, won't see as much at all. Other areas can see significant accumulations, 30 plus centimetres. I don't think there's necessarily any climatological factor in East Anglia. Some parts of central and northern Britain tend to be a bit more favoured in these easterly air flows simply because there's a longer sea track across the North Sea. And particularly, I would say you're probably talking about the central belt of Scotland and some parts of eastern Scotland, Perth up towards Aberdeenshire. Um, from what I've seen, at least very subjectively, those areas tend to be favoured um, to see more frequent snow showers in these easterly air flows. But I wouldn't necessarily say uh, East Anglia has any significant uh, climatological uh, reason for seeing uh, heavy snowfall. got D who asked uh, I just commented I wouldn't expect the GFS to capture the minimum temperatures very true uh, how did the finer model how did the finer resolution models yeah it's, uh, it's very true and uh, yeah I mean I was showing GFS just as, a, as, as an example there um, I'm uh, I'm just getting up to grips with my uh, my coding at the moment so I haven't got all of the uh, the uh, the higher resolution models available I could show you potentially but in terms of in terms of to answer your question um, 
We saw, I, I would still say in general, um, the, high, the models probably underestimated the extent of the minimum, minimum temperatures, particularly on the morning of the 11th. Um, ECMWF, for what it's worth, has got, got a high resolution, generally a bit better um, than uh, GFS. Uh, I'd say there's probably still about three or four degrees out, minimum temperature wise. Um, yeah, some of the really fine resolution models were getting down to about minus 20 degrees or so. Um, but again, uh, still not quite cold enough, I would say. I, I think we I think we need a finer resolution even more to capture the, the, the goings on on the valley floor. You know, I was talking about the, the depth of the cold in these really cold pools, uh, you know, only a few tens of meters deep. And it's not just the horizontal resolution, it's the vertical resolution you've got a question as well. And uh, if you're not if you're not trying, if you're not able to capture the uh, dynamics within the lowest 10 meters or so, uh, 10 to, to, to well, say 50 meters, and I think you're really going to struggle to properly capture the intensity of the, uh, the cold pools that develop. Good. Uh, that actually flows quite nicely into our next question, which is from Scott, who asks, does the depth of the snow affect the temperature reading itself because the thermometer is no longer at the standard height when the snow is deep? Uh, does the depth of the snow affect the temperature reading? Uh, yes, I suspect it does. Um, I guess if you're... Um, it's a good question. I think if you're probably lower down uh, to the, the, the or closer to the snow, if the snow level's ri risen, uh, then you're perhaps going, I, I would I speculate you perhaps be looking at lower temperatures um, if you're going to be seeing a thermal gradient away from the, the snow moving upwards. Um, but to be honest with you, uh, Scott, and that's a very good question. Uh, I'm not totally certain um, if I'm honest uh, on that, but I'd speculate that it probably would have a, a significant uh, difference, particularly across, uh, I guess, the highlands where you're looking at uh, you know, 70 centimetres, et cetera, of, of snow depth, um, uh, then that would have a, a major impact there. But yeah, I'm not too, not too certain on, on the answer there, uh, Scott. So uh, the next one is slightly technical, so bear with us for a second. Uh, Barry is asking, did the exceptionally cold wave in USA in the second slash third week in February reactivate the jet stream, causing the huge Atlantic cyclone, which drove out or undermined the blocking high pressure system, causing our very cold spell? Question. So I guess for those not in the know, uh, Barry is perhaps referring to the extreme cold which occurred in uh, southern central parts of the US. Um, it was probably around about three weeks ago now. I guess Texas, of course, had some extremely cold weather then. Um, now, quite often during these events, yes, you can see a reactivation of, of the jet stream, but we've got to be mindful that you end up with several baroclinic zones that develop along the east coast of the US uh, that can be influenced by these uh, severe cold uh, episodes. Uh, now, the east coast of the US itself actually tends to act as a firing line or an initiation zone of the jet stream. But the extent to which uh, that makes its way across the Atlantic um, can be a bit questionable at times. Now, I would say it's possible um, that this cold outbreak may have had some impact, but I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest um, that in general it did. I think I think we can probably trace uh, the Atlantic systems we've seen over the last uh, few, uh, over, uh, over the last week or so in particular um, back uh, back to some uh, vorticity elements perhaps involved across uh, Oklahoma, for example. But I'm, uh, in answer to your question, I would say I'm not sure it did necessarily, um, just because some of the effects as they move across the Atlantic tend to be quite uh, non-linear um, with re with relation to how how it affects the uh, the jet stream. Uh, all right, next up we've got Andrew, who's asking, the light powdery snow that fell in my part of North London melted upon contact with pavements and roads, despite the near zero temperatures. Do you have any ideas why? Well, there's a couple of reasons for it. I mean, the most obvious answer perhaps is that uh, got some solar radiation coming through during uh, early to mid February, so maybe maybe that was actually raising the temperatures of uh, of the surface slightly above zero, so perhaps some slightly slight meltage occurring then. But actually, if you consider the fact that the air mass itself is very dry, um, you know, you're looking at dew points down at minus seven, minus eight, minus nine degrees or lower. Um, I suspect there'd be a significant amount of sublimation. Um, is it sublimation? It is sublimation uh, straight from the. Um, solid to the ga gaseous form um uh, of, of the of the of the snow crystals so uh, i think that's probably something to consider as well they were just sitting around on the surface being quite exposed to the air and i suspect they were sublimating quite quickly um as well then one is from alessio who asks the zonal winds dropped below zero 
below, they, zero, the zonal winds dropped below zero three times. Why did only the final reduction result in the easterly winds across the UK? Uh, result in easterly winds? I'm not sure we can quantify that uh, necessarily. Um, there, were, there were three, Alessio is correct in pointing out, there were three reductions in the in the easterly winds. I'm not sure, entirely sure where Alessio is. Uh, maybe Alessio can send me some further information on this after the event, but I'm not quite sure where he's getting this uh, this inf info from uh, regarding the final um, SSW uh, or, or, or weakening of the, of the winds into easterly, causing the uh, easterly winds. But uh, the general tendency is for that weaker vortex nest, perhaps, to allow uh, an inc increasingly likely an increasing likelihood of a, uh, of a that sort of subtly displaced jet and a more of an increased likelihood therefore of winds coming from the north or northeast. But Alessia, yeah, if you've got any um, any time after this event, perhaps uh, drop me a, drop me a message on my Twitter account, something like that, and uh, get in contact might, might be a good idea there. It's a Twitter handle. All right, uh, got two questions left. Uh, second to last is from Alan, who asks, what information do you use to predict snow accumulation? During snowfall, there are times when snow depth increases and times when it does not. Is this always due to air temperature? This is actually the measuring of it. Uh, now, a lot of, you know, if, we, if we're using, we have to use verification methods uh, on the models to actually get some real-time data on how things are performing. Now, a lot of um, official observations, e observation these days are done automatically um, using uh, ground-based uh, laser measurements, uh, etc. But there's there's increasingly infrequent use of uh, actual manned, um, or, or I should say, person. Um, uh, uh, observation uh, networks these days, uh, and actually, you've, you've got that—that that you've got that fact that that automated process introduces some uncer some uncertainty. But you've also got the fact that snow drifts around quite a lot. Um, so actually, getting um, precise and accurate measurements when there's drifting occur that occurring that often requires a human eye to give a, some fin finesse to the information. But in terms of uh, actual accumulations, um, you know. Uh, it depends. Uh, it depends what you what you and what data you've got access to. But these days, um, models themselves are becoming uh, relatively good, especially when you use a, an ensemble of different members or an ensemble of different models to um, predict the snowfall. Uh, those are the sort of things you, you'll be looking at, um, and perhaps to, uh, perhaps also to give some uncertainty on the on the range of different snowfall accumulations. But these days, I'd say models are generally becoming uh, fairly good in terms of snow accumulation. What they're not so good at is um, predicting actual actually how long the snow lies around for. There are significant problems with models um, actually melting snow, um, particularly the East WF that has a significant issue of melting snow, and that caused some major issues in terms of minimum temperatures, which I didn't really talk about too much. But um, yeah, th those are the sort of uh, those are sort of ideas we uh, we use anyway to sort of uh, try and measure snow properly. Um, Isabella who asks, what causes the temperature on Cairngorm to be higher than in Braemar? Uh, so uh, perhaps non-intuitive uh, initially, if you think about it anyway, Cairngorm's at 1.2 kilometers, Braemar down at 337 meters. Why is it so much different? Well, uh, obviously, if you were to take a yearly average, Braemar will, I'm sorry, Cairngorm will have a lower temperature than Braemar. But in these uh, in these certain situations, Braemar tends to have, more, or I should say the valley sites, Braemar, Aviemore, Newton Moor, wherever you are, they'll tend to have um, more significant extremes in temperature. So higher, higher highs, lower lows. Uh, and that's simply because Cairngorm, the summit of Cairngorm is very exposed to the wind. Wind, uh, in terms of temperature, is the sort of, um, well, it's the ultimate battle, I guess, really. If you've got strong winds, it really uh, inhibits temperatures from uh, varying too much. Strong winds cause a lot of turbulence, so that causes a lot of mix mixing of the air and that really prevents temperatures from uh, changing too much on the on the local scale so ultimately uh Cairngorm, that was measuring the actual temperature so to speak of the air mass aloft so at 1.2 kilometers uh Braemar, of course you saw much uh, stronger temperature variations there but that was ultimately uh, on that particular night on the morning of the 11th that was ultimately measuring essentially the temperature just very locally on the valley floor um but that was ultimately as a result of, of drainage flows from the sides of the valleys down towards the uh, the valley floor there so that's ultimately why you see uh, those big differences very more much more sheltered not so much wind there um and uh, that ultimately re results in uh, more significant temperature variations uh, 
All right, thank you very much. Uh, that does it for questions. So I think we can wrap up here. Again, lots of comments in the chat about how informative and how much everyone's enjoyed your talk. So uh, thank you very much. I'll give you one final round of applause. Have a good evening. All right, so yeah, if you want to get in touch with Richard, have any more questions, uh, feels, please feel free to uh, contact Richard via Twitter. His handle is at RMBWX. And if you enjoyed this type of analysis, you can get plenty more of that from uh, stratastech.co.uk, which is Richard's blog. So just got a few final things to wrap up this evening. Um, this talk has been recorded and will be posted on the uh, Royal Meteorological Society YouTube channel uh, in the next few days or so. And also our next talk, which is in April on the 21st at, at 7 p.m. my usual time, uh, this will be a talk by Professor Ian Brooks, who's going to talk to us about the Mosaic Project. This is where they froze a ship into the winter ice in the Arctic, and they made some very novel ocean atmospheric measurements, so that should be very interesting. And then finally, thank you once again to our speaker, Richard Martin Barton. Thank you to the RMET organizers behind the scenes, especially to Eleanor. And finally, a big thank you to all of you for attending this talk. We hope to see you again next time and good night.